Wood embedding with PyTorch and Lightning Hooray StackQuest. Hello, I'm Josh Starmer and welcome to StackQuest. Today we're going to talk about word embedding in PyTorch plus Lightning. Don't stress out about the cloud. Use Lightning. Bam. This stack quest is also brought to you by the letters A, B, and C. A, always. B, B. C, curious. Always be curious. Note, this stack quest assumes you are already familiar with word embedding. If not, check out the quest. Also note, you can download all of the code in this stack quest for free. The details are in the pinned comment below. In the stack quest on word embedding, we created a simple neural network that converted the words or input tokens troll2, is, great, and gemkata into numbers which we call word embeddings. We also showed that these word embeddings allow words that are used in similar contexts like troll2 and gemkata to appear close to each other when we use the embedding values to plot each word on a graph. Bam! Now, in this stack quest, we'll learn how to build and train this simple word embedding network with PyTorch plus Lightning. First, we'll do it from scratch using just tensors and some basic math. And then we'll simplify our code using the PyTorch linear function. Lastly, we'll learn how to use the PyTorch embedding function to load and use pre-trained word embeddings. The first thing we do is import Torch to create the tensors we will use to store the raw data and to provide a few helper functions. Then we import Torch.nn to create the weights we will use in the network and to bring in some other helper functions. Then we import Atom to fit the neural network to the data with backpropagation. Then we import Uniform to initialize the weights in the network. And to give us the tools to create a large scale embedding network with lots of training data, we'll import tensor dataset and data loader from torch.utils.data. Now we import lightning as L to make it way easier to write our code and for automatic code optimization and scaling in the cloud. Lastly, we import pandas, matplotlib, and seaborn so that we can draw some pretty graphs. Now we will create word embeddings for these two simple sentences. Troll2 is great, and Jimkata is great. So we will need to create an input for each unique token in the training data. And these inputs will eventually connect to this word embedding network. Now, if we wanted to run Troll2 through the network, we would put a 1 in the input for Troll2 and a zero in all of the other inputs. Oh no, it's the dreaded terminology alert. When we specify the inputs like this, where one input gets a one and everything else gets a zero, it's called one hot encoding. So if we want to run the word is through the network, we specify the one hot encoding with a one for is and a zero for everything else. Likewise, this is the one hot encoding for great, and this is the one hot encoding for Jim Kata. Now, going back to the one hot encoding for Troll2, in PyTorch, we can create a four element list with one in the first position for Troll2 and zeros in all of the other positions to recreate the one hot encoding for Troll2. Likewise, we can create similar one-hot encoding lists for is, great, and Jim Kata. And once we have a list for each possible input, we make a list of these lists. And because we're using PyTorch, we convert the input lists into tensors with torch.tensor and save the tensors in a variable called inputs. Now, the goal is to create a simple network that can predict the token that follows a specific input. For example, if the input token is troll2, then we want to predict the word is. And that means we want the output for is to be 1, and the outputs for all of the other tokens to be 0. 
In PyTorch, that means we want to predict the one-hot encoding for is. Likewise, when the input is is, then we want to predict great. And thus, we want to predict the one-hot encoding for great. Great is at the end of each phrase and nothing comes after it. So, in theory, it shouldn't predict anything. But if we had a larger training data set, it probably would predict something. So, in this example, we'll just pretend that it predicts Jim Cotta. Lastly, Jim Cotta, just like Troll2, predicts is. Now let's combine the output lists in a list, and convert the output lists into tensors, and save them in a variable called labels, because in machine learning, that is what we call the known or ideal output values. And now we are done encoding the training data. Now that we have the inputs and labels, we can combine them into a tensor dataset that we'll call dataset, and then use dataset to create a data loader called data loader. Data loaders are super useful when we have a lot of data because, one, they make it easy to access the data in batches. Two, they make it easy to shuffle the data each epoch. And three, they make it easy to use a relatively small fraction of the data if we want to do a quick and dirty training for debugging. But Josh, we don't have a lot of data. Why are we using a data loader? You're right, Squatch, we don't have a lot of data. But in a more realistic setting, we would, so we might as well do it now. Okay. Anyway, now that we have the data taken care of, let's write the code for this simple word embedding network. When we create a neural network in PyTorch, we always start by defining a new class. Now, because we're coding our first word embedding network from scratch, we'll call this word embedding from scratch. And in order to make coding super easy, we'll inherit from lightning module. Then, just like we always do, we create an initialization method for the new class. This method will create and initialize all of the weight tensors that we need to implement the embedding network. And it will also create the loss function that we'll use during training. Then we'll create a method called forward that makes a forward pass through the embedding network. Then we'll create a method to configure the atom optimizer. And lastly, we'll create a method called training step to calculate the loss, which in this case will be the cross entropy loss. The cross entropy loss function will quantify the difference between what we want the output to be and what we actually get for the output. Note, there's a lot more to be said about the cross entropy loss function, so if you're curious, check out the quest. Now, let's start by coding the init method. The first thing we do is call the initialization method for the parent class, Lightning Module. This is simply required whenever we inherit from a class in Python. In this case, this will allow us to take advantage of all the features that Lightning offers. Now we need to create and initialize the weights for the network. And we're going to do this by using a uniform distribution to randomly select an initialization value for each weight. Specifically, we're going to use this uniform distribution that goes from negative 0.5 to 0.5 to generate random numbers for the weights. The shape of this distribution shows that all values between negative 0.5 and 0.5 have the same likelihood of getting randomly selected. Hey Josh, why are we using values between negative 0.5 and 0.5 to initialize the weights? Good question, Squatch. We're using this specific range of values in order to match up with what we will do in the second part of this tutorial when we use the PyTorch linear function to do the math. And the linear function selects a range of values based on the number of inputs. Okay. Anyway, in order to use this uniform distribution to generate random numbers for us, we create a variable called min value and set it to negative 0.5, the minimum value we want to randomly select. And we create a variable called max value and set it to 0.5, the 
the maximum value we want to randomly select. Now we create a parameter for the first weight associated with the first input and use uniform.sample, which we imported earlier, to initialize it with a random number. When I did this, the first weight associated with troll2 was randomly set to 0.38. Then the second weight associated with troll2 was randomly set to 0.42. Now we just create and initialize parameters for all of the other weights associated with each input. Bam! Now we've created and initialized all of the weights associated with the inputs. Likewise, we create and initialize parameters for all of the weights associated with each output. Now we have all of the weights initialized for our word embedding network. Bam! Now, the last thing we need to do in our init method is give our class access to the cross entropy loss function. And we do this by calling nn.crossentropyLoss and saving it in a variable called loss. Now that we're done coding the init method, we can use those weights to code the forward method to make a forward pass through the embedding network. For the forward method, the input is a list that contains the one hot encoding for one of the input tokens. For example, the input might be the one hot encoding for troll2. However, when it is passed to the forward method, it comes wrapped up in an extra set of brackets. So, the first thing we do is remove those brackets by setting input to be the first element. Now we multiply each input value by its corresponding weight that goes to the activation function on top. And add the products together. And we save that sum in a variable called inputs to top hidden. Then we multiply the inputs by the weights to the activation function on the bottom and add the products together. And save the sum in a variable called inputs to bottom hidden. So, and now we have the code for the first part of the word embedding network. And since the activation functions are identity functions, which means the input is the same as the output, we can multiply inputs to top hidden and inputs to bottom hidden by the next set of weights directly. For example, we can multiply inputs to top hidden by the first weight going to the top output, and then multiply inputs to bottom hidden by the second weight going to the top output, and then add those two products together, and save the result in a variable called output1. Then we do the same thing for the other outputs. Bam! Now we've done all the math up to the softmax function. And that actually means we are done making a forward pass through the embedding network. Because the loss function that we're using for backpropagation, nn.crossentropyLoss, does the softmax for us. So the last thing we need to do is package up the output values using torch.stack and save everything in a variable called output presoft max. Note, if instead of using torch.stack, we just returned a list of the output values by wrapping them up in square brackets, then the gradients would get stripped off and we would not be able to do backpropagation. So, by using torch.stack, we can return a list that preserves the gradients. Anyway, the last thing we do in the forward method is return output presoft max. Now that we have the forward method, we are ready to configure the optimizer. And configuring the optimizer, in this case Atom, is so easy we can just replace the pseudocode with the real code. We pass Atom the parameters we want to optimize, and we set the learning rate, LR, to 0.1. Hey Josh, why did you set the learning rate to 0.1? Because our example is pretty simple and I wanted to train relatively quickly, I tested out a relatively large learning rate, 0.1, and it worked. Okay. Now let's talk about the training step method, which we'll use to calculate the loss. The training step method takes a batch of training data and the index for that batch. 
And the first thing we do is split the batch of training data into the input and the labels, which are the ideal output values. Then we run the input through the network up to the softmax function by passing it to the forward method. For example, if we run the one-hot encoding for troll2 through the untrained network, these are the values that the forward method will return. We then run those values along with the ideal values through the loss function. nn.crossentropyLoss then runs the output values through a softmax function and quantifies the difference between the softmax output and the ideal values. And we save that difference in a variable called loss. And then return the loss. Now, at long last, we've made it through all the code needed to create word embeddings from scratch. We create and initialize the weight tensors and create the loss function in the init method. We make a forward pass through the embedding network with the forward method, configure the atom optimizer with configure underscore optimizers, and last but not least, calculate the loss with training step. Bam! Now let's use the new class we just wrote to create a new word embedding network that we'll call Model from Scratch. And let's print out the randomly selected weight values that it starts out with. Here, we just have a for loop that iterates over all the named parameters in the network. And for each parameter, it prints out its name and value. And here's the output. Now, to be honest, this list of numbers is kind of hard to read, so let's organize it into an easy to read data frame. So, the first thing we do is put the weight values into a dictionary. The first part, labeled W1, contains the weight values for each input that goes to the activation function on top. Note, we're using the item method to get the weights because it returns the tensor values as Python numbers. The second part, labeled W2, contains the weight values for each input that goes to the activation function on the bottom. Then we just label the tokens and inputs, and save the dictionary in the variable called data, and then transform data into a pandas data frame called df, and print out df. And this is what the data frame looks like. Now we can easily see that the weights for Troll2 and Jim Cotta are relatively different, even though they both represent movie titles that are used in the same context. This table is pretty helpful for making the embedding values easy to look at, but a graph would make them even easier to look at. This graph has the weight values to the top activation function, W1, on the x axis and the weight values to the bottom activation function, W2, on the y-axis. With a graph, it's super easy to see that the embedding values for Troll2 are very different from the values for Jim Cotta. To create the graph, the first thing we do is call the Seaborn function scatterplot. And we pass scatterplot the data frame, df, that we just created. And we tell scatterplot that we want to use the weights that go to the top activation function, w1, on the x-axis, and the weights that go to the bottom activation function, w2, on the y-axis. Now, if all we did was call scatterplot, then we'd end up with this scatterplot. And while this scatterplot is super cool, it would be much cooler if each dot were labeled with the word or token that it represented, like this. So, in order to add the tokens as labels to each point, we call the matplotlib text function, and we pass in the x and y axis coordinates for the point in the first row in the data frame, and the value for the token. Then we specify how we want the text aligned, the font size, the font color, and lastly, the font weight. Then we do the same thing for each row in the data frame. And then we call plt.show. And we get this super cool looking scatter plot. 
Like we mentioned earlier, we can now see that the embedding values for Troll2 and Gymkata are pretty different. And that means we need to train our embedding network. We start training by creating a Lightning Trainer called Trainer and tell it to train for, at most, 100 epochs. Which means we will do backpropagation for every weight using the training data at most 100 times. Now we call the Trainer's Fit method and pass it the embedding network, called model from scratch, and the training data, called data loader. In theory, it should only take a few seconds to train our simple embedding network. And when it's done, we recreate the data frame that has the weights or embedding values for each token. And we can either stare at the embedding values in the data frame, or we can draw a scatter plot of the tokens just like before. Note, because the labels for Troll2 and Gymkata are overlapping and hard to read, I then added little offsets to where Troll2 and Gymkata were printed. And now we can see that after training the embedding network, the embedding values for Troll2 and Gymkata are very similar, which is great since they are used in similar contexts. Bam! Now that we have trained our embedding network, we can see what it predicts when we use Troll2 as the input. Remember from when we created the training data that we want Troll2 to predict is. So the first thing we need to do is create a soft max function because we didn't have to explicitly use it in our model. Note, we set dim equal to zero so that we can apply it to rows of output values. If we set dim equal to one, then we would apply it to columns of values. Now we pass troll2 as a one-hot encoded tensor into model from scratch. And we run the output values through the softmax. And then round the output of the softmax to two decimal places. And finally, print out the result. And we get the one-hot encoded tensor for is, which is correct. Bam. Likewise, we can verify that all of the other inputs to our embedding network create the correct outputs. Okay, now that we know how to create and train a simple word embedding network from scratch, let's make our lives a little easier by using the PyTorch linear function to create the same network. So let's create a new class called Word Embedding with Linear. And again, in order to make training super easy, we'll inherit from Lightning Module. Then create the init method that we'll use to create and initialize the weights. And, like always, we'll call the init method from the parent class. Now comes the interesting part. Instead of calling nn.parameter to create and initialize each weight in the network, we only have to make two calls to nn.linear. The first call creates the weights between the inputs and the hidden layer. n features equals four means we are connecting four inputs to two nodes specified with out features equals two in the hidden layer. In other words, this call to nn.linear will make four weights for each of the two nodes in the hidden layer. And since we don't need any bias terms, we set bias equal to false. The second call to nn.linear creates the weights between the hidden layer and the outputs. It creates two weights with n features equal to two for each of the four outputs with out features equal to four. And again, since we don't need any bias terms, we set bias equal to false. Now, the last thing we need to do in our init method is give our class access to the cross entropy loss function. Now we need to code the forward method that makes a forward pass through the network. The cool thing is that all we have to do to calculate the sums before the activation functions is pass the input to the linear object, input to hidden, that we created in the init method, and save the sums in a variable called hidden. The linear object, input to hidden, does all of the multiplication and addition for us. Bam! 
Note, now that we are using linear to do the math, we no longer have to strip off the extra brackets from input like we did before. Anyway, because the input to these activation functions is the same as the output, we can just ignore them and pass hidden to the second linear object we created, hidden to output. Hidden to output calculates the output sums from the activation functions. And we save those output values in output values. Now, remember that we don't need to calculate the softmax because the loss function, nn.crossentropyloss, does it for us. So all we have to do is return the output values. Bam! The next thing we do is create the configure optimizers method. And, just like before, we use the atom optimizer and pass it the parameters we want to optimize and set the learning rate to 0.1. The training step method is also similar to what we did earlier. And that means that this embedding network is contained in this class definition. By using nn.linear, we significantly reduced the amount of code we need compared to when we did everything from scratch. We can see the difference when we shrink the original code for the word embedding from scratch class down so that we can fit it on a single screen. And compare it to the size of the word embedding with linear class on the same hard to read scale. Bam! Now we can create a new model, model linear, with our new class, word embedding with linear. And, just like before, put the pre-trained word embedding values into a data frame called df. Note, because we used nn.linear to create the weights, we access them with dot weight. And we call detach to remove the gradient from the tensors. And we use 0 and 1 to index the weights that go to the top and bottom activation functions. And, lastly, convert the tensor to a NumPy array with NumPy. Now, when we print out our data frame, df, we get this nicely formatted table. And we can draw a scatter plot of the tokens just like before. And that gives us a scatter plot that looks like this. And the graph suggests that the embedding values, or weights, are not yet optimal because Troll2 and Gymkata are so far from each other. So, just like before, we can train the model for 100 epochs, and after training, we end up with these weights. And the weights going from the inputs to the hidden layer are the new embedding values. And when we redraw the scatter plot with the new embedding values, we see that the values for Troll2 and Gymkata are similar. Double bam! Now that we know how to create word embedding networks from scratch and with nn.linear, and we can create word embeddings that put words and tokens used in similar contexts near each other, let's learn how we can load and use pre-trained word embedding values with nn.embedding. Note, in this example, we're just going to load and access the embedding values we created. But, in practice, we might want to load and use the word devec embedding values, which have 100 values per token and millions of tokens, or the embedding values created by a transformer like ChatGPT. However, before we get started, let's just print out the embedding values from the last model we trained, Model Linear. We access the embedding values in model linear just like we did when we created the data frame, except now we don't have to worry about the gradients. And we get two lists of embedding values. Specifically, the weights are arranged in two rows. The first row corresponds to the weights that go to the top activation function. And the second row corresponds to the weights that go to the bottom activation function. Now, the problem with this is that nn.embedding expects the weights to be in columns, just like in the data frames we created. The good news is that converting rows into columns is super easy. So, with that said, let's load and use these pre-trained word embedding values with nn.embedding. We start by creating an nn.embedding object. 
and we pass the pre-trained weights in with from pre-trained. And we use dot t to transpose the rows of weights into columns. Lastly, we save the new embedding object in Word Embeddings. We can then verify that we did things correctly by printing out the weights. And we see that the weights are now arranged in two columns. Now we can print out the embedding values for the first input, troll2, by passing in a tensor with the first index value, 0. And the embedding values match what we expect, so we know we did things correctly. Accessing the embedding values by index is fine, but we can also make our lives easier by creating a dictionary that maps the tokens to their indices. And now we can more easily access the embeddings with the token itself rather than the index. And that's all there is to loading and accessing pre-trained weights into an nn.embedding object. We can now use our embedding object, word embeddings, and connect it to a larger neural network like a transformer. Also, before we go, I just want to remind you that you don't have to type this code yourself. Instead, you can download it. And I wrote tons of comments that explain every little detail just like this stack quest. The link is in a pinned comment below. Triple bam. Now it's time for some shameless self-promotion. If you want to review statistics and machine learning offline, check out the StatQuest PDF study guides and my book, The StatQuest Illustrated Guide to Machine Learning, at statquest.org. There's something for everyone. Hooray! We've made it to the end of another exciting StatQuest. If you like this StatQuest and want to see more, please subscribe. And if you want to support StatQuest, consider contributing to my Patreon campaign, becoming a channel member, buying one or two of my original songs, or a t-shirt, or a hoodie, or just donate. The links are in the description below. Alright, until next time, quest on!